So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about upper extremity DVT. And once you understand the foundations of lower extremity DVT, we really just can translate those skills to the upper extremity. And the only real challenge there is making sure we know what the anatomy is, what it looks like, and where to look. The take-home points here are same thing. We're going to assess clinical likelihood. There are basically four venous segments that we're going to look for. Again, the veins of interest are always going to be touching arteries. And do they compress? Yes or no. And the four kind of junctions that we're going to look for, we I usually start distally. You don't have to do that. You can start proximally and work your way down. I start with the brachials, then I go to the axillary vein, subclavian vein, and the internal jugular. It's not always intuitive that an upper extremity DVT exam should include the subclavians and the internal jugular, but those are part of the exam as well. Uh, there's less literature on this because it's less common, so I don't have a lot of literature to cite on upper extremity DVT. It's mostly descriptive literature, but the skills from lower extremity DVT, in fact, I would argue that once you have the skills down, the upper extremity is actually a little bit of an easier exam than the lower extremity. A little bit of literature that's out there, uh, the risk factors are about the same hypercoagulability. There seems to be, again, this is mostly anecdotal. Most of the times when I see these, it's because they've got a pick line or they recently had a pacemaker place. It seems we see these more in patients who have been instrumented or have catheters or something like that. The literature would also suggest these are associated with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, so keep that in mind. But other than that, venous thromboembolic disease risk factors are pretty uniform no matter where you're talking about it. The arm, the leg, the mesentery, doesn't really matter. So we're going to talk about the points that we're going to look for. So I usually start distally and work my way up. That's just my preference. No real science behind that, but try to have a consistent method so you, you do things consistently, don't miss things. So I start at the brachials. Remember the brachials are gonna be medial. All of the deep veins are touching arteries. Then I just work my way up the arm and I generally just follow the brachial artery and its associated veins up the arm as far as I can. And then I'm gonna get into the axillary and make sure the veins here compress. And then the subclavian vein, this is probably the hardest part of the exam just because it's deep and the clavicle's kind of in your way. But I'll show you with a little practice, you can do this. And then lastly, the internal jugular. I just find the trachea and slide laterally and you'll run into it every time. So here's a little bit about what these are gonna look like. So so the brachial vein, remember, the brachial artery is a little bit on the medial side of the supinated arm. And many patients have a pair of brachial veins. Not every patient, but most patients have two brachial veins touching the brachial artery. And a lot of times, if they're normal, they may be spontaneously collapsed. So if you look and you don't even have to compress and you see the artery all by itself and the veins are collapsed, then those are normal and there's no clot there. And just to see in live action what that's going to look like, we'll play this here. So we'll find the artery. So if we're on the brachial artery, we should see the brachial veins right next to it, and they compress, the artery resists compression. Here's a cephalic vein over here, very superficial, compressible. And that's the median cubital vein arc going over top, really superficial as well. And that leads us to basilic, just somewhere over here, right there. After I've followed the brachial artery and the brachial veins all the way up the arm, basically get into the axilla. And sometimes there are a pair of veins here. Sometimes you only see one. Uh, it starts to get pretty big here, so it's pretty easy. But again, in contact with the artery. And here's kind of what it's going to look like. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at a video. Uh, before it starts, I will point out in this scenario, the operator, I don't know who that weird guy is that's holding that ultrasound probe, but is standing behind the patient. That's not necessary. We can do all this from standing in front of the patient. Just in this scenario, that's what we were doing. So we're just gonna check out the uh, structures in the axilla. In this case, I have, since I'm behind the patient, I'm gonna just keep the indicator away from me because it's more away from me on the screen where I'm looking. So in the axilla, We identify the axillary artery and vein. The vein is compressible, the artery is not. 
And then once we've followed the brachial veins all the way up the arm, found the axillary veins, make sure they're compressible, we're going to look for the subclavian vein. Now the way I like to do this is place the probe transecting the clavicle, so indicator is towards about 12 o'clock, so towards the wall if the patient's lying flat. And as I slide below the clavicle, then follow from the axilla to the neck, somewhere along there I should find the artery and the vein. The vein is usually going to be a little bit more superficial and a little bit bigger than the artery. In some patients it may be spontaneously collapsed. So if you examine deeply enough and all you find is the artery and the vein is collapsed, then that's a normal vein. A few tips I will say, you can have the patient valsalva, you can lie them flat to help distend the vein, just to help you make sure you see it. And then you can either sit them up, you can have them sniff to demonstrate that it collapses. Sometimes it is difficult to compress because the clavicle kind of gets in your way. Sitting the patient up, changing their position, having them take a quick breath in or a sniff, can help demonstrate that it collapses. If it's spontaneously collapsed, which is common when a patient is sitting upright, you know it's normal. Just make sure you have found the deep artery. You'll often see the pleural line kind of sliding right underneath. And if that vein is spontaneously collapsed or it collapses with a quick respiration, then it's normal, there's no clot in it. I'm gonna come out of the chest mode for a minute to look at subclavian vessels. So if we're looking for upper extremity DVT, we would do this. So we come up linear probe, we come right up on the clavicle, right on the middle, find the clavicle, slide just below the clavicle. And then we can see the subclavian artery pulsing down here. And if I ask him to Valsalva, big breath and hold. Now we can see the subclavian vein and now relax. And we can even compress it a little bit. That's it down there next to the artery. If it's spontaneously collapsed, there's no clot in it. And if we're not sure, we can lie them back. Could also be That's a good target for central access too. Bear down again. So there's the vein we could target that for central access. And the artery's a little bit deep. Okay, you can relax. Or if we flip him on his head, then it's a good target that way. And so the last piece of this, again, we found the brachial veins, we followed them up the arm, found the axillary vein, we made sure it was compressible. We find, we find the subclavian, which is arguably the harder of all of them. And then next we just come up and find the internal jugular vein. Again, if the patient's sitting upright, a lot of times it's spontaneously collapsed. If it's spontaneously collapsed, it's normal. But again, the deep vein, the internal jugular vein, in contact with the carotid artery. These are just some examples of clotted vein. So here is, I think this is probably the axillary artery. This is axillary vein. You can actually see a catheter in here. So this was associated with a pick line. And this vein doesn't collapse completely. And we can even see a little clot in there. This is a subclavian. So we see the artery deep. And if we're really paying attention, we see a little bit of lung sliding down here. This is a subclavian vein. We can see the thrombosis. This is an obvious subclavian thrombosis. And again, over here, the artery. I'm not sure exactly where on the arm it says axilla. So another axillary example where we're compressing. We're compressing enough that the artery collapses some, but that vein does not completely collapse. So we have a partial thrombosis here. All of these are DVT. All of these are enough to make clinical decisions on therapy right away. So this brings us back to the case we talked about earlier, our 59-year-old male who had arm swelling and a history of renal cancer has a PICC line in place. We can see obvious DVT associated with this PICC line and even up into the subclavian. So we're going to go ahead and initiate therapy. And currently, we have moved to direct oral anticoagulants even in cancer patients. So this is another patient who could be treated as an outpatient, assuming there's no other complications. So quick decision, immediate, satisfying for the patient, efficient for your clinic 
or wherever you're working. So a few mistakes to avoid. Most of the mistakes, the most common mistakes are not identifying the arteries and focusing on superficial veins instead of deep veins. So in both of these cases here, I don't even know if this is upper or lower extremity, but we find a vein, it collapses, but we don't see any artery associated with it. And the other thing that I'll point out is this is all just in the superficial subcutaneous tissue. Uh, it's probably only about one and a half or two centimeters deep. So that's another clue that we're not looking at the correct vein. Same thing here. We find a small vein. It's isolated. There's no artery with it. It's way up here, only about two centimeters deep in the subcutaneous tissue. These are superficial veins. These are not the veins of interest. There may be a deep venous clot down deeper that we're missing. So go deep enough, find the arteries, and when you compress, you should see bone at the bottom of your screen. So those are superficial. Don't make that mistake. Not deep enough, no artery. Here's another one from a leg. In this case, now this is not a terrible case, but in this case, the operator was distracted by these superficial veins and not paying attention that, in fact, down here was the deep artery and vein. It's not clear whether they collapsed or not. I think we see the artery in the vein, but the user was clearly and in reading the notes, distracted by these superficial vessels and not didn't definitively find the popliteal vein and didn't follow it to its trifurcation. Um, here's another example. This is a vein that is very superficial. It does collapse. This vein does collapse, but we can see some very stagnant blood flow within here. And sometimes stagnant blood flow is a clue to a more proximal clot. The mistakes here are, this is one, this is a superficial vein, so it's not really the vein of interest. But two, if we see stagnant flow, kind of smoky flow inside any vein, we should follow that proximally to see if it leads to a thrombosis somewhere else. But in this case, the artery and vein of interest are actually hidden somewhere over here, but the focus of this user was directed incorrectly and they missed the true deep vessels that were over in this part of the leg. So they're not deep enough, they didn't identify the artery, and this stagnant flow is sometimes a clue we need to look further. Last kind of tips and tricks, patient positioning when we're looking at the leg, get the patient as flat as we can. Don't have them sitting up with their waist at a 90 degree angle. Always, always, always find the deep arteries. And remember, if the veins are spontaneously collapsed without hardly any pressure, then there's no clot in there. If the subclavian is difficult to image or if it's difficult to tell if it collapses, then you may have the patient take a quick deep breath or sniff, um, or maybe you just sit them upright to demonstrate whether it collapses or not. And you can always compare sides. That's the nice thing about these extremity vessels. There are generally two sides for most patients, so if we're not sure, we can kind of compare sides and see how it looks different. That's all of our basic information. The quick summary is the take-home points. Remember, we are practitioners of medicine first. We start with assessing their clinical likelihood before we even place the probe on them. We look for, in the leg, those three deep venous junctions, but we follow the veins all the way down the thigh as far as we can. Those veins need to be touching the arteries, and we're just asking ourselves, do they compress, yes or no? Our quality point of care ultrasound includes the saphenofemoral junction, the common and deep femoral junction, and all the way down the thigh. And then at the popliteal, we want to translate the probe or slide the probe to see the trifurcation as well. For the upper extremity, the clinical likelihood assessment stays the same. There's really four segments, so the brachials, axillary, subclavian, and IJ. Again, same thing. These veins should be touching the arteries. And then we're asking ourselves, do they compress? Yes or no. So there's those four segments of the upper extremity venous anatomy to focus on. Brachial, axillary, subclavian, internal jugular. We assess the likelihood. If the likelihood is low and they have a negative point of care ultrasound, and it's quality point of care ultrasound, then you can be done. If they're moderate or high and you have a negative quality point of care ultrasound, then they need repeat within a week. If they truly have high suspicion, so the swollen purple leg, the swollen purple arm, and you don't see a clot, but you still suspect it, there are select scenarios where further imaging with venography of some sort may be sought. So point of care ultrasound for DVT, this is quick, it's easy, if it's done well, it's accurate, and this is a patient-centered thing that can make our care more efficient, more timely, and it's a rewarding thing to do for patients when you can walk in and definitively say within a few minutes, yes or no, here's what you have, here's our treatment plan. So thanks for your attention. I hope to see you all scanning real patients in real time sometime soon.